Father Sofroni wished his monastery to be loyal to the tradition of orthodoxy, but also open to the spirit of this world. I had the opportunity, the blessing, to meet Father Sophronios of Essex many times. He was never my spiritual father, but I often heard him speak on questions of prayer and the living of the Christian life. Let me refer first of all to the monastery that he established. The monastery of St. John the Forerunner, St. John the Baptist, in the village of Tolleson Knights in Essex. His monastery had two very precious qualities. It was and is traditional, loyal to the authentic tradition of orthodox monasticism, which Father Sophroni himself had learnt during his years on the Holy Mountain. But it was, it is, was and is also a monasticism that is open to the world at many levels. First of all, they practice excellent hospitality. They make visitors welcome. And that can be a difficulty for monks that the visitors may disturb the life of prayer that the monks wish to follow. And so in some monasteries, visitors are made to feel that they are an intrusion, but not in the monastery in Essex. Father Sophroni practiced hospitality. And this openness of his monastery to the world was shown not only in the way guests were made welcome, but in the way Father Sophroni himself wanted his monks to be in touch with the intellectual currents of the present age. He wanted his monks to be educated. At first he used to send them to the Russian Orthodox Institute of St. Sergius in Paris. But later on Father Sophroni sent one of his own relatives, his great nephew, Father Nikolai Sakharov, to Oxford to take study theology at Oxford, where I was teaching. But I said to Father Sofroni, the program will not be orthodox. For most of the course, his teachers will be um, Anglican, Protestant, or Roman Catholic. Um, why not send him to uh, Paris? And Father Sofroni said, for this very reason that he will have to study with non-Orthodox and learn their outlook and how they are thinking and how he should respond, for that very reason I want to send him to Oxford. So he came to Oxford, he took the undergraduate degree with first class honours and then he went on to do a doctoral dissertation under my guidance. So. Father Sofroni wished his monastery to be loyal to the tradition of orthodoxy, but also open to the spirit of this world. If the monks are to provide guidance spiritually to those who visit, they must know something of the predicament from which these people come and the problems that they face. And so I saw these two things, traditionalism and openness 
in Father Sofroni. He was, in many ways, a very bold person because in his monastic community he introduced certain innovations. The community does not have the daily office, orthros, hesperinos. On weekdays they merely have in the morning two hours Jesus prayer, two hours in the evening and they say the Jesus Prayer together in the same chapel. One person says it a hundred times, then another takes it up. They don't all say it aloud together, only one voice at a time. At weekends, Saturday evening and Sunday, they use the, they have a vigil service in Agripnia on Saturday and in the morning, the liturgy, but in the week, the Jesus Prayer. So that is something unusual. Another unusual feature of the monastery has been that they have monks and nuns together, worshipping together. Of course, they live in different buildings, quite separate, but they have their meals together. This is different from the traditional Orthodox monasticism. So he was traditional, but he was also bold. And I might say that in the many years that the monastery has existed, there has never been any scandal of any kind. Yes, in his personal theology, Father Sophroni was also very bold. He extended the idea of kenosis, for example. The Greek fathers use the notion of kenosis, self-emptying, only with regard to Christ's incarnation. But Father Sophroni in his theology saw the act of creation as already an act of self-emptying. God, as it were, limits his omnipotence in order to make room for what is not himself. This is an idea he took from the Russian theologian Father Sergei Bulgakov, but he extended the idea of kenosis even further and applied it to the life of the Trinity, that in their mutual love the persons of the Trinity empty themselves in order to be open to the other. This is quite an unusual idea. I'm not sure whether I personally agree with it. But I mention this simply to show how Father Sophroni was a bold person in his teaching, in his own thought, as well as in his organizing of the monastic life. But if he was bold, he was also a humble person. He was a very sensitive person who was upset by criticisms and attacks. And I recall once when I was in the monastery, in front of the brothers, he said to me, I have made many mistakes and I have made mistakes because I was too much afraid, afraid of what other people would think and say. And that has misled me. And he spoke with such suffering at that moment. So while he was bold, he was not complacent. He was a sensitive, in a good sense, person, perhaps too sensitive. Um, he would never have claimed to be perfect. Um, now people begin to think of the sanctity of Father Sophroni. Well, we have to recognize that holy people had their personal struggles and difficulties, and they had their own difficulties of character, and Father Sophroni was well aware of his own failings. But 
what he has done has so far endured. He came to England with his little brotherhood around 1959. The community had already existed in France, but it took its present form around that period. So now we can speak of half a century of the life of the monastery in Essex. It is not merely something that has arisen momentarily and then disappeared. Since Father Sophroni's death, his successor, Archimandrite Kirill, continues faithfully with the line of the community. So what Father Sophroni established, through a lot of personal suffering, has endured and as I see it the monastery continues to go from strength to strength. An aspect of Father Sophroni that I did not yet mention was his sense of humour. He was a person who, as I say, was sensitive, who had suffered a lot from criticism, from misunderstanding, but he did not lose his sense of joy and I can remember his humour. For example, one day he was asked at table in the refectory, when will the liturgy be on Wednesday? And first he turned to an English Orthodox, not me, who was sitting next to him, a very earnest young man who always came early for the liturgy. And he said, the liturgy on Wednesday will begin at 10 o'clock. Then he turned to a Greek lady on the other side, who always came late, and he said, the liturgy on Wednesday will begin at 7 o'clock. So this was typical of his sense of humour. His book on St. Silwan has opened the eyes of very many people and certainly it has influenced me. His own writings are often quite complicated, especially when he speaks about hypostasis, um, but his interpretation of the teaching of St. Silwan is most valuable. And if it was not for Father Sofroni, the world would never have learnt about St. Silwan who led a hidden life in the Russian monastery. I remember when I went to the Russian monastery, oh, back in the 1960s, um, this was long before uh, St. Silvan had been glorified as a saint, um, the Russian monks said to me, why are you English people always talking about Father Silvan? There was nothing so extraordinary about him. We have had many monks like that in the monastery. Yes, Father Silvan was a humble monk who faithfully led the life of prayer, such as the monk follows. But if it wasn't for Father Sofroni, he would have remained completely hidden, like the other monks they mentioned. I'm sure there are many hidden saints on the holy mountain. But it's good that sometimes there is an interpreter who will make them known. And that is what Father Sophroni did. <laughs>